So what is robust political economy? Well, something is robust if it's actually able to withstand various stresses and strains. In the context of political and economic institutions, we can define something as being robust, or political institution or an economic institution as being robust, if it's able to withstand the stresses and strains that are wrought by various human imperfections. Now, there are two human imperfections that I focus on in the book. The first is the idea of limited human rationality. The idea that human beings are not fully rational agents. They are not omniscient beings. Whenever they make decisions, they do so in a context of considerable uncertainty. There is always imperfect information when they're making decisions. We need, therefore, to evaluate institutions in terms of how well they cope, how robust they are in the face of this inevitable human weakness. More specifically, if decision-making takes place in a context of imperfect information, what kind of institutions facilitate learning over time, and what kind of institutions minimize the consequences of what will be inevitable human mistakes or human errors? The second human imperfection that we have to take account of is the problem of what I describe as limited benevolence. The notion that people may, under certain circumstances, act out of self-interested motivations, that they may be opportunistic in certain circumstances. On this kind of a view, we need to evaluate institutions in terms of the incentives they provide to channel potentially opportunistic actors to behave in a way which actually increases the overall level of well-being in society, that improves the public good, if you like. So those are the two human imperfections that robust institutions actually have to deal with. Now, in the first part of the book, I claim that challenges to classical liberalism, the various challenges to the classical liberal tradition, fail to meet the criteria of robustness. Their particular alternatives to the classical liberal ideal of a minimal state and open markets do not address how their own favored institutions will deal with the problem of limited rationality and the problem of limited benevolence. The classical liberal case for a minimal state framework with an open market economy based on the dispersed ownership of property is based on the claim that these institutions are more robust in the face of limited rationality and limited benevolence. A competitive context is the best context to deal with the, play, with the fact that people are imperfectly informed. When we have lots of different decision makers making different sorts of decisions, we can facilitate a process of trial and error learning which minimizes the consequence of any particular errors. If you centralize decision making in one place and people make mistakes, then the consequences are much more far reaching than if that decision making power is more dispersed. Likewise, a classical liberal framework which provides for exit enables people to escape from the depredations of potentially predator, pre predatory actors. If people are acting opportunistically, the capacity to exit from relationships with these actors is what provides a disciplinary check on potentially self-interested behavior. Now, what I claim is, throughout the book, that the challenges to classical liberalism whether it's market failure economics or communitarian and egalitarian variants of political theory, lack an account of how their favored institutions can deal with these problems of limited rationality and limited benevolence. And I want to work through now in the rest of my presentation a few examples to illustrate this particular point, which lies at the heart of this book. Okay, let's start off with market failure economics. Market failure economics, or for want of a better phrase, mainstream neoclassical economics, evaluates market institutions against the benchmark of full information equilibrium. Any departures from this full information equilibrium are described as market failures which is considered are ripe for some co kind of corrective government action. Now, 
if we take the perspective of robust political economy and focus, first of all, on the idea of limited rationality, then this notion of perfection or full information in this particular context simply isn't a valid standard against which to evaluate either market institutions or any other institutions for that matter. The case for markets isn't that they are perfect institutions. The case for markets is based on the view that they are best placed to cope with the inevitability of imperfect information and limited rationality. So, for example, take the notion that neoclassical economists focus on of imperfect competition, which is often, often considered to be ripe for some kind of corrective government action. If we're in a world of limited rationality, of imperfect knowledge, then knowledge of what should be produced and how it should be produced isn't going to be evenly distributed. It's going to be unevenly distributed. Some firms are going to judge the market better than others. Some firms are going to make more profits than others. Other firms are going to make losses. It's precisely through these imperfections or inequalities that a learning process is set in motion so that people can learn over time to copy the more successful firms and to avoid the business models that are adopted by the less successful firms. Any market which is based on imperfect information, unevenly distributed knowledge, is going to look imperfect when judged against a standard of perfection. The question is, what is the alternative to this imperfection? Is it a world where regulators somehow magically are supposed to know what the ideal market structure is. If we're in a world of limited rationality, there's no reason to suppose that government regulators that are in a monopolistic position are in a position to know what the ideal market structure is. Now, you may say that this kind of analysis is somewhat old hat, that there are new market failure theorists, such as, for example, the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, who are well aware that government is likely to fail in the way that markets fail. When push comes to shove, however, if you actually look at what writers such as Stiglitz do, they always hold markets against a different standard to public policy interventions or to government regulators. Stiglitz is fond of saying that the price system, because of its various imperfections, is too coarse a decision-making instrument to enable people to make effective decisions. What he lacks is an account of why government regulators should be assumed to be in a position to correct for these market imperfections. Now, if I may, I'd like to quote from um, a little piece of scripture to, um, to illustrate um, this particular point. This is what Stiglitz says. Now, bear in mind, he believes that He's arguing that government can improve on the results of an imperfect market. This is what he says. A full corrective policy would entail taxes and subsidies on virtually all commodities based on estimated demand and supply elasticities for all commodities and all cross elasticities. This is the key phrase. The practical information required to implement the corrective taxation is well beyond that available at the present time. <laughs> Supposedly, though, given all of this, we're supposed to trust still that government regulators are going to be improving on the market outcome. Stiglitz doesn't give any justification for this assumption whatsoever. He fails, in my view, to meet the standards of a robust political economy. Now, there are other examples where Stiglitz commits the same sort of error in terms of incentives. Stiglitz is fond of pointing out various instances where there is asymmetric information in markets, where there are problems of high transaction costs or principal agent problems which lead to various market failures. What he doesn't do, though, is explain again how a public policy alternative can somehow be immune from the very same deficiencies. It's very interesting if you look at the way he completely misrepresents the work of Ronald Coase in this context. Anybody who knows anything about Coase will know that his whole work is focused on the problem of transaction costs. 
This is Stiglitz, and again, I'm going to quote from some scripture, speaking about Ronald Coase. Coase went wrong in assuming that there are no transaction costs and information costs. But the central contention of this book, and the book he's referring to here is his book, With a Socialism, is that information costs are pervasive. Assuming away information costs in an, anal in an analysis of economic behavior and organization is like leaving Hamlet out of the play. Now that's Stiglitz describing what he, he thinks is Ronald Coase's view. This is actually what Ronald Coase says about the matter. The reason why economists w went wrong was that their theoretical system did not take into account a factor that is essential if one wishes to analyze the effect of a change in the law on the allocation of resources. This missing factor is the existence of transaction costs. The whole of Coase's analysis or case for the market economy is based on the recognition that yes, there are principal agent problems within markets, which lead to so-called market failures, but that we always have to compare these to the alternative. Anybody knows anything about public choice theory and the way it analyzes the way that governmental structures actually operate would know that controlling a government is the mother of all principal agent problems. There's no incentives in most contexts for voters to try to inform themselves about what politicians are doing because the chance that any one individual voter can affect the result of an election is infinitesimally small. The case for private enterprise is precisely that principal agent problems are more pervasive in the public sector than in the private sector alternative. Conclusion, Stiglitz's approach does not meet the standards required by a robust political economy.